you. Thank you. Hello and uh, good afternoon. My name is Kai Fu Li. I'm here to talk to you about AI and China. I'm going to have someone super famous tell you what AI is all about. It's a great thing to build a better world with artificial intelligence. And wait a sec. <clears throat> so you only thought his granddaughter could speak Chinese. <laughs> but that was not President Trump talking. That was a Chinese speech synthesis system built on deep learning that can speak in multiple languages. And deep learning is the core technology that had a huge breakthrough in the last 10 years. And the way it works is think of it as a mathematical black box. If you pick one single domain, ideally one single task, because it can't do lots of domains and tasks, throw in a lot of data and give it a lot of labels and tell it what to optimize, then it will automatically learn at a superhuman accuracy. So that is a huge breakthrough, and that's at the very, very core of the artificial um, intelligence revolution. And um, to give you a little bit more color on what types of applications there are, sometimes people think of AI as uh, speech and vision, sometimes think about it as Google and Facebook, sometimes you see the flying cars. It is all of the above, because underneath all those applications is the same algorithm, deep learning, that is doing what I described. Single domain, lots of data, label, and the, with a knob to tweak in what's called an objective function. Um, and, and, and we see that AI is coming in four waves. They're waves, not phases. So they come all together, some earlier, some later. All four waves are happening now, obviously with the internet being the first wave. So why is that? Because AI works better with more data. Um, it is really not rocket science anymore. It's pretty well understood by a lot of really smart people. And if you have a ton of data, the technology just works better. So every time you collect 10, more, 10 times more data, it just jumps to the next, next level of performance. So now you understand why the leaders in AI are all internet companies, because the internet has a ton of data. So in the US, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, in China, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, and others, are the ones with the most data. Because every day we use the internet, uh, we are contributing data, but more than contributing data, we are labeling data. Uh, how are we labeling data? Everything you buy on Amazon, every story you click on Facebook is a strong piece of data to that company that signals you or someone like you at a time like this may want to read this, or may like it, or may uh, buy it. And every one of those likes, clicks, and buys is rocket fuel that makes these companies stronger. So we've been contributing hugely to these near trillion dollar companies. Um, <clears throat> think about it. If you're a business executive and someone gave you a black box and it says, uh, use your, take, take your favorite business metric and tweak that metric automatically and money or whatever just comes out. So Facebook may tweak more minutes per user. Amazon may, may tweak uh, more revenue uh, per visit and, um, or more total revenue. And Google may click, uh, may tweak you know, more ad clicks. Uh, I'm not saying they do that, but that is an amazing uh, capability that as the CEO that you now have to tweak the data uh, to tweak the um, uh, AI so that it optimizes your business objective. So that's why AI is like printing money for these internet companies. So that's phase one, wave one. There will be more internet companies. Uh, with the internet companies, you got to get the user, get the data, then you're onto something. Now let's talk about wave two, because internet companies aren't the only companies with the data. Who else has data? Businesses, right? In their ent enterprise software, in the data warehouse, what type of businesses? The ideal business for AI in business is financial because there is no friction. There's no warehouse, logistics, delivery. All you've got is a human fabricated uh, game of numbers where accounts, receivables, uh, investments, insurance policies, they're all numbers. They come in and then the CEO says, tweak something. Minimize credit card fraud. Uh, minimize loan default, maximize investment return, and so on, and magic happens. 
Of course, they're not quite there yet uh, because these companies have old, older DNAs, takes time to transform, but in due time, all of our financial um, uh, institutions will be fully um, uh, in, infused with artificial intelligence with much greater efficiency and profitability. Let me jump to, one, to give you one example. We invested in a company, uh, not a traditional one, but an app to borrow money. So uh, this app, if you download it, and you can just say, I want to borrow $300, and in less than one second, the money goes to your phone. Uh, in China, mobile payments, okay? And of course, it may reject you, but if it accepts you, uh, instantly. So how many of you would take $300,000 of your money, go outside in um, Los Angeles, and find a, a thousand people who you think will repay your loan, and just give them $300 each? What kind of default rate would you have? No, 80%, maybe a little bit lower in Los Angeles, but, but really high, right? But this app has a default rate to really strangers, no, people they've never met, uh, at 3%. And now, charging credit card-like interest rate, you can your, do your math in your mind and see how wildly profitable this business is. And how is it done? It's AI. What is the input to the AI? Of course, you have to input a lot of things in the form, your name, address, income, uh, and so on. Uh, but also, there are 3,000 other attributes that you um, agree to send from your phone uh, that are part of the AI. And it's those 3,000 attributes that are really, really critical. So you're probably thinking, oh, it's sending all my secret photos and everything. No, it's sending nothing more than what Android and iPhone would permit an app developer to get. Uh, same as Facebook, no more, no less. So that information goes in, and now all of a sudden the AI engine can consider not just your application, but also what type of phone do you have? How, what apps do you have installed? Uh, do you have games? Uh, do you have gambling apps? Do you have knowledge-based apps? Um, and it also knows um, uh, uh, when you bought your phone, how much memory it has, and it, it also knows what day of the week, what day of the month is it? Is it before your payday or after your payday? Of course, borrowing money before payday is reasonable. After payday, maybe not so reasonable. So, and also, how long did it take for you to type your address? Uh, too fast or too slow may indicate fraud. So all of these things go in. And just out of curiosity, we went in and, and asked, show, least, show us the least relevant feature, but still useful. And then they, they, they pulled it out. Number 3,000 on the feature list was the battery level of your phone. That contributed to whether to give you the loan or not. Why is that? Because if you are an o have OCD, plug in your phone all the time, it's probably a little bit correlated with someone who repays the loan. And if your battery, if you keep letting your battery run out, well, maybe it's a little bit correlated to the contrary. Now, now this is this is not you know giving you a terrible credit or anything. It's just one loan decision. But you can imagine AI is drawing correlation from 3,000 features against the pool of people who um, repaid the loan and the ones who defaulted. So how did it ever train the system? Well, with our VC money, of course. So when we invested in this company, we gave them $10 million, and then half a year later, they came back and said, well, we spent it all. Where did you spend it? So said, well, we made a lot of bad loans, and now we have data. <laughs> and then they said, well, we've gone from 18% you know, default uh, down to 8%. Uh, Give us another 50 million. So we gave him another 50 million, came back later, spent it all, lost it all again. <laughs> but our default rate is now down to 5%. We can now break even on each loan. So this is time to really grow our business. So that's an example that hopefully illustrates the power of AI of why humans can never do this kind of thing. Okay. Wave two also goes to obviously uh, clinics, governments, and cities, and so on. Wave three is perception AI. That's um, uh, speech recognition, computer vision, um, and autonomous stores and things like that. So taking, giving you an example of, um, of a computer uh, vision app. Um, there's a face recognition company in China. Um, mostly you read about you know, surveillance apps, but I'll give you an example of how this can be used to make our environment safer. So recently, a very famous singer in China, Jackie Chung, uh, gave um, four concerts in China. 40,000 people came. And uh, as a result of these concerts, 23 most wanted criminals were arrested.
because in the entry, uh, each person, there is a camera, and the camera is connected to the most wanted database, and 23 people were arrested. So this, no human, uh, whether you agree with that use or not, whether you think it's a privacy intrusion or not, think about, can hu just think about the technical level. Can a human policeman ever ha have in his or her head a million names and faces and then watch all the people entering? Absolutely no way. So that's why AI is amazing. Then the fourth level is way four. That's where robots, um, robots could uh, do things like um, uh, agriculturally, uh, water and uh, fertilize plants, pick fruits. It can be used in factories to, for visual inspection and, and simple assembly. Uh, it can be used for delivery. We've seen all of, all of that. Uh, and we're invested in an autonomous fast food. And it's basically like McDonald's, except they're new humans. You go in and just um, either with your face or with your WeChat, uh, you tell it what, uh, scan in and tell them what you want to eat, tell the system what you want to eat, and a bowl of beef Chinese noodles is $1.75. So this is one quarter the price of McDonald's and tastes a lot better. So this kind of thing will become popular and I think a lot of convenience stores and um, uh, fast food will uh, turn over into AI. Of course, high-end restaurants will still have humans, but uh, most restaurants and uh, convenience stores, we don't really need that social experience. And of course, there's autonomous vehicles, flying cars, and so on. So these are the four waves in our mind over the next 15 years will continuously uh, have new applications uh, providing huge value to humanity. And the five premises of making AI work, as I said, it's a single domain, lots of data, there has to be tagging, lots of compute power, and uh, some AI experts to make things work. And now let's talk about China. You probably think that US is way ahead in AI technologies. That is true in terms of inventing AI, deep learning, AI, US leads China um, tremendously. Uh, all, the, all the inventors and the thinkers were uh, American. However, uh, why does China have a chance in this uh, uh, global uh, competition for leadership in AI? Because there are a few observations that need to be made. The first is that AI is not rocket science. AI doesn't have a lot of breakthroughs. There's only one big breakthrough called deep learning. Deep learning is getting easier and easier to use. A uh, really good computer science student can use deep learning and apply it to all kinds of problems. And, um, um, and there are not a lot of breakthroughs coming out every year. So if there were breakthroughs every year, then US would be ahead of the rest of the world. But if there aren't that many breakthroughs, and frankly, a lot of the top university professors in AI have been poached by Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. So for academia to make broad progress anywhere is hard. So my argument um, is really that we've moved from the 10 year ago, five year ago, early adopter phase where the very few people know deep learning and they demand a premium and they can do things no one else can. Today, the technologies are getting easier and easier and the, this will favor not he or she who writes the best papers, thinks the deepest thoughts, but who is good in implementation. And a lot of platforms are making this really lowering the barrier of entry. Uh, top computer science students can, can do this. So China really has six advantages. Um, I'll just quickly talk about them. Uh, number one, lots of great engineers. Chinese university en engineering programs are really great. And uh, all the engineers want to be AI engineers now. So we get to pick the best. We as in entrepreneurs and VCs and, and, and tech companies. Number two is that China has a great VC ecosystem that is um, equal, in my opinion, to Silicon Valley. Equal but different to Silicon Valley. China's approach to entrepreneurship is incredible hard work ethic, um, winner take all, and uh, the CEO makes all the decisions. You can argue that's not the Silicon Valley way, but at that actually gets companies going faster and faster, delivering results focused on attention and uh, execution. Uh, number three is that the Chinese innovations are really matching the U.S. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but 10 years ago, China was largely still copycat. But because the market is so big and the entrepreneurs are so tenacious and hardworking and execution-oriented, and the market kept growing, and 
capital kept infusing into China, uh, many of those copycats became good entrepreneurs. And some of those entrepreneurs became, in, became innovators. So today I can list uh, probably 10 apps in China that you've never heard of here. Um, as an example, and financial, it's definitely not PayPal, if you can look into it. Uh, if you want to look into TikTok, it is actually outdoing uh, Instagram and Snapchat in terms of video social network. And there are many, many other examples. So China is able to innovate, and that's the third reason. The fourth reason is that China has a ton of data. So in the era of AI, uh, data is the new oil, and China is the new OPEC. And um, uh, this, what is this data? Well, this data isn't uh, government collected. A lot of people confuse this. It's still corporate collected, but this data comes from a large, num much larger user group, four times that of the US. And actually, each person has more depth in usage. So it's breadth in number of people and depth in usage. As an example, the payment data is arguably the most valuable data. Because as you know, what you click on may or may not indicate your intent, but what you buy is a really strong indicator. So who has all that data? Visa has some, MasterCard has some. They don't have any way of really figuring out what to do with it. But in China, mobile payment. Uh, if you ever go to China, you'll find there is really no credit card or cash anymore. And that mobile payment has the following effect on the China economy. Uh, first. Uh, no longer is their credit card taking away two or three percent tax at the economy. Two, it's much faster. Two clicks on your phone and you're done. Imagine your favorite social app, Facebook or whatever, has a payment in it. Then you can pay, and imagine you can pay anybody, any friend you have on Facebook, any merchant, any person, by just scanning. My wife was uh, uh, out shopping a month ago and she told me she saw a beggar holding up a sign. It says, I am hungry, scan me. And it only takes two seconds to scan and pay somebody. I was just with uh, one of the attendees trying to add each other on WhatsApp, and it took us you know, three minutes. So this is really efficient. It will also, because of the expediency of payment, it will turn China from a um, savings economy to a spending economy. And most importantly, this is incredibly important data for training AI. And the fifth reason is actually more money is going into Chinese AI than US AI measured by venture capital spending. And then finally, the Chinese government is providing a lot of help, subsidies, and most importantly, infrastructural support. As an example, autonomous vehicle. US is clearly ahead of China by about two to two and a half years. However, um, in the US, there are a number of barriers, such as um, uh, uh, truckers union lobbying, and uh, potential liability in lawsuits and, um, and, and so on, that may sl and, and also media headlines that may slow things down. But in China, what's happening is the Chinese government asked the question, well, our AI companies aren't as good as US, but if, what if we change the road? What if we build a city? So a city is being built with two layers, one in the city center. One layer is for pedestrians, one layer for cars and that would completely avoid the kind of accident that we saw in Phoenix with Uber. So that will help the Chinese autonomous vehicle companies to launch sooner, safer, collect more data, and potentially catch up or even win in terms of technology. And the cost to build a new city, well, you figure it's a giant city the size of Chicago with the whole downtown as two layers. So those are the kind of infrastructural spend that I think are very, very smart. And, um, um, uh, arguably similar to President Eisenhower when he built the interstate highway um, many decades ago. So uh, the markets are, and, and also he, he, here are some examples of China. China now has 18 unicorns in AI. Uh, we're proud investors in five of them. They're valued at $21 billion. Uh, I don't really know the US numbers, but I suspect Chinese AI companies are probably worth a little more than US right now. Measured uh, field area by area, China currently has the world's most valuable uh, drone company, computer uh, speech recognition company, translation company, and um, uh, computer vision company. So who, who's really ahead? My belief is if we look at research, US is clearly ahead. Ignoring research, just look at implementation, user base, monetization, revenue, and uh, market cap. I think this is what we're looking at. China going from nothing a few years ago, going into slightly ahead of the US four or five years from now. 
Uh, again, this is purely commercial. This slide is not intended to show a zero-sum game because Chinese tech companies, AI companies, sell only in China. And in the future, they may sell to some Belt Road countries. So their success would not come at the expense of an American company. But people ask a lot, so that's my answer. Um, and we, we see that um, this, it's emerged. So with this pu pushing forward, my belief is that uh, AI is just one piece of, of the technology. You can look at all the things on your phone. It's got your, your apps, your e-commerce, social entertainment, uh, the, who makes your phone, and then you've got the server, uh, who makes the you know, 5G and, and the cloud and uh, data and the AI connecting cloud and phone. So this is my prediction in five years. If we just did a survey of every human being and every server in the world, I think China will power about half of the world. This is not saying it's a good thing or bad thing, nor is it saying a parallel universe is a good thing, but this is just, I think, an inevitable outcome uh, that will be accelerated by the current geopolitical tensions. And the red countries and pink countries are the ones who will be more Chinese and blue countries will be more American. <clears throat> So uh, lastly, a few words about Sinovation Ventures. Uh, we are actually very much built as a venture capital firm on this premise that China will have a lot because if U.S. powers half, China powers a half. Uh, U.S. is more or less status quo. China is all growth. Um, a lot of people question whether Chinese software is any good because only Chinese use it. But I think I've shown you lots of examples in mobile and AI and others that the technology is good. If it's good, it will glo go global, half global. So that is the premise of Sinovation Ventures. Uh, my company is a VC firm. Uh, these are our investments in the last um, uh, s uh, seven years in all kinds of AI companies. And um, our fund has done very well. Our AI fund is up about 56% net IRR annually. Um, and um, the work that we do is not just in VC, because one of the really unique things about China is the large population and lots of engineers, lots of engineering population. So, so we're impatient to wait for the engineers to meet the entrepreneurs and, and come up with a business plan. So we created a very unique entity called the AI Institute, where we hire engineers. Because we've done well on our funds, we, just, uh, we can hire engineers directly. We hire about 300 and uh, spin off companies, not very many, maybe one a year, uh, when we really see a business opportunity that maybe entrepreneurs don't yet see. But this is not an incubator. It's uh, uh, driven by our investment team based on theses that we see in a way that doesn't compete with the portfolio companies. And a very unique thing that we also do is we train AI engineers. Since I told you this is not rocket science, therefore it means you can train them. Universities generally do a very poor job training AI engineers. So we actually bring our portfolio companies in to train with us these uh, students who will graduate within a year. And then in just in less than two months, they become very good AI engineers. And part of the magic is forget the academia, just train them on real world problems with real data, with a large amount of real data, so they really know what AI is about. Secondly, you have to have a large population of uh, students to select from. This year, we will get 15,000 applicants, from which we will take uh, 1,000, and we will train them. And then we will have them select our portfolio companies and our non-AI companies who, who have a hard time hiring AI. And the rest can come to AI Institute, and we will incubate uh, for them. So I think um, this is a really exciting opportunity from a technology point of view. Uh, China and US are both leaders. And uh, we look forward to uh, changing the world in AI with you. Thank you.